here tonight to speak with you about the invasive forest pests. These are the three that are particularly uh, uh, serious, and, and th these are the kind of the three that are on the top of our list right now uh, as far as what we're concerned about. I'm presuming you've probably all heard of hemlock woolly adelge. It, of the three, it's the one that is known to be here in Vermont. Um, Asian longhorn beetle is not far away, down in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, and then emerald ash borer, uh, I'm not sure if you have heard, but it is uh, present in Connecticut and in Massachusetts and in the Hudson River Valley in New York State, uh, and also in Quebec, just, just beyond our borders to the north. Uh, so we're really surrounded by these, these pests. And when any one of them arrives in a locality, there are all kinds of ramifications and all kinds of impacts. Um, these two are, or, or excuse me, emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid are uh, exclusive feeders to the hemlock and the ash tree. And then Asian longhorn beetle eats a wide variety of hardwood trees, but their favorite food is maple, all, all species of maple. Emerald ash borer, all species of ash. Hemlock, <laughs> both species <laughs> of hemlock trees. Um, and, and so when they arrive, uh, towns and, and citizens and forests, they, they all experience impacts. And, and what we're finding out is that um, if we can prepare and if we can monitor and, and, uh, and detect these things early, we can minimize some of the impacts. Um, of these three, Asian longhorn beetle has proven to be the sort of insect that can actually be eradicated. Just last week, New Jersey declared itself free of Asian longhorn beetle. And. And, and some of the other infestations of Asian longhorn beetle, like the one in Chicago, have been declared eradicated. Hemlock woolly adelgid is here. Honestly, our department doesn't expect to ever eradicate it, but we feel that it's, it's, it's reasonable to expect that we can learn to live with it and manage it. There are several very promising biological controls, uh, and it seems to be moving more and more slowly as it spreads northward. Uh, it also seems to be taking a longer amount of time to kill trees as it goes northward. So we feel like we can live with this one. We feel like if this one came, especially if we detect it early, we could eradicate it. But emerald ash borer is, is a very serious, serious concern. Uh, it was first discovered in, in the Detroit area in Michigan, and it's been spreading now for about 10 years. And, and now we don't talk about if EAB, emerald ash borer. We don't talk about if it arrives. We're talking when it arrives in Vermont. It's, it's pretty much a certainty. Um, all species of ash are susceptible, and, and there has not been anyone anywhere that has found a way to contain it or eradicate it. And it kills trees quickly. Uh, mature uh, ash trees can be killed in, in three to five years. Uh, and typically, by the time we discover that emerald ash borer is present, we're already two or three years into that, that time frame. Uh, so typically, we don't really know we've got the problem till trees are dying. Um, so this is, this is a, right now the, the outlook is quite grim. Um, one of the other things that I want to say about emerald ash borer, though, is that when the trees die, some of them that are located on municipal properties will become hazardous trees that towns will become liable for. And that's one aspect of emerald ash borer infestation that towns that didn't plan on, uh, they've all of a sudden found to be a huge impact. Towns that, that prepare and understand that that will be an issue uh, can, can mitigate some of that impact. And it is possible, even though all trees are expected to die, all ash trees are expected to die. It is possible to save certain select trees with, with the chemical insecticide. There are several that are extremely effective if you decide in the given situation that that's what you want to do. 
So my first point for you tonight is that EAB is coming and the trees are going to die. And some of those will become hazard trees that the towns will become liable for. And, and that's, that's what I would like to, to tell you about tonight is that uh, the Department of Forest and Parks, along with the UVM Extension Service, has created a, a program, a set of materials, some of them are inside your packet there, to help towns prepare for the arrival of Emerald Ash Borer. And planning and preparation can, can reduce the impacts. If you look inside your packet, on the right hand side, you'll, you'll see a, a pest alert if you need more information about emerald ash borer than I've been able to give you. Uh, there's, there's information about the insect itself. And then right under that, there's a little, uh, little sheet that we've designed to help uh, town officials understand what's going to happen. And then underneath that, there are just some frequently asked questions that a more general audience, the, you know, the, the citizenry of your town might ask. And then on the left-hand side of your packet is a, is a little four-pager that we specifically designed to help people approach their select board or their tree warden or their town manager, you know, the people that, that kind of make things happen. This is known as the overview, and it briefly describes the coming problem. It describes some of the impacts. And, and our hope is that, that you as members of conservation commissions uh, might be the person that would take this message to the, the powers that be in your town. Um, there is another uh, group of people that we're working with to, to bring that message, and they are first detectors. There's a little brochure in there. Um, these are volunteers that have, have contacted us and gone through our training. Uh, they're made aware and familiar with all three of the, the invasive pests we're really concerned with at the moment. Uh, they receive a bunch of other... Um, uh, preparation, they receive a lot of materials and, uh, and guidance, and they serve as liaisons with, with my department and Extension, uh, and also the Vermont uh, Agency of Agriculture, uh, to help towns prepare for the arrival of these bugs. They, they assist with our survey work, they assist with our uh, monitoring work, with our educational programs, uh, and as we begin to receive calls, you know, people are already calling and saying, oh, I got that beetle. And, and I can't always field all of those calls. And first detectors will sometimes do that for me. So um, if you are interested or you know people in your town that are interested and, and have a passion for this kind of thing, uh, you'll see inside that we have two more uh, trainings coming up this spring, uh, one in May and one in June. And we are actively recruiting for more uh, volunteers. Um, when this bug arrives, we're going to need the help. Before I go any further, let me say that we're certain it's coming, but we d have no idea when. It's, it's very difficult to predict when it will arrive. Um, EAB does not move like a, like a tsunami or, or, or like the flu. Uh, you know, it doesn't start here and just, just spread and hit everything in its path. What happens is that often it's moved in infested material like firewood. 80% of all the new infestations of emerald ash borer are associated with campgrounds. The other, the other really kind of high risk sort of things that move emerald ash borer, I mean it's capable of spreading itself, it's actually a pretty strong flyer. Um, but the other things that are associated are the movement of nursery stock, and, and then uh, other infested materials like uh, pallets, wooden crates, lumber, that sort of thing. And, and so uh, there will be quarantines when emerald ash borer arrives that, that attempt to reduce the, the artificial movement of these bugs and, and slow its spread. Um, How does the state handle the quarantine? <clears throat> the, the quarantines will, will be a matter the, the state works with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It'll be a federal uh, quarantine. It, this is 
a federally regulated uh, insect. But is, that, is, that, is that this the insect with the purple boxes? Yes. Who puts those boxes up? Well, in the last two years, it's been done by a contractor. It, it was just put out to bid. Oh, that, but but that's a, it's a program of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Yeah, because I've seen them in Massachusetts. Yeah, you know, they're, they're the entire northeastern half of, or quarter of the country. Yeah. Just as an aside, you know the results of the, this past uh, seasons, what we found, what was found? There were no positive finds. Emerald ash borer is not known to be in Vermont. Yeah. And, and, and just, uh, I'll get to it, and just, I just want to finish that idea. We know it's coming, but we don't know exactly when, and we don't know exactly where. And, and like I said, it doesn't spread like a tsunami. It, it could show up in Hartford. And, and there would be one little dot on the map to show an infestation for years. And, and then it could show up in, in you know, Burlington, and, and it could take years for those, those infestated, infestation spots to grow on a map and coalesce. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we don't want to uh, scare people into um, kind of irrational acts, but we want people and towns to get ready and, and then to, to uh, gear your actions to monitoring reports. And that's why it's so important to have volunteers like this to help us be doing the detection work. Uh, yeah? Well, I'm just not sure. I thought that some, you're saying all species of ash die, but not all ash die. All species of ash? That's a different, you say all ash die, so I think people could think that every ash tree is going to die. Almost every ash tree. Is going to die. I thought there was still a there is a there is a phenomenon out in the lake states where emerald ash borer has been present for the longest. There's a phenomenon known as lingering ash, and there is a handful of trees that, for some reason, somehow survived when every other tree around it is dead. They were obviously exposed. They're sometimes infested, but they're not dead. And, and they are being studied. They're, they're, scientists are trying to determine if there's some mechanism for natural resistance, and if they could you know, isolate that, it might help. Um, but even the lingering ash are slowly becoming less and less vigorous. Um, for all intents and purposes, unless they are protected with chemicals, over a 10 or 15 year period, all the, all the ash in an area will die. I mean, it's very, very grim. I'm, I'm sorry, I kept ignoring. Yeah. Does Vermont have, or are they working to put in place a law to prohibit the movement of fire from one tree to another? We are surrounded by states that have firewood regulations, uh -huh. uh, which which helps. Do we have? But we do not. And are we trying to get some? Uh, at the current, at the present time, I'm not aware of a move to create legislation like that. We're trying to do it through education. We, we don't have the, the people or the money to enforce a law, even if we made one. <laughs> There's been a lot of uh, outreach, though, about not bringing firewood into Vermont campgrounds. Yeah, we are trying. I mean, it's, I saw a lot of it last summer, yeah. so, you know, outreach, so. Yeah. Both the other people yeah, and private campgrounds have begun to really get on the bandwagon and help us. In the state parks, we have an exchange program. If people bring firewood from more than 50 miles away, we'll take it and give it them safe wood. And, and we bag, double bag, actually, the, the foreign wood, and we dispose of it properly. I'm sorry, this, did you have a question? I, I'm a recent Vermont <laughs> transplant, okay. and I'm wondering how what percentage, and I know that's going to vary from forest to forest, but how many ash are in the state? Uh, I mean... No, I used, to, I used to actually know a number, but I'm forgetting what it is. Um, but ash over, overall is, is like 8 or 9% of the trees in, in our Vermont forests. But if you look... Um, gosh, see, I should have done the PowerPoint after all. <laughs> there's... there's <laughs> There's, there's, a, there's a slide in a slideshow that I have that shows the breakdown by county of the number of ash trees, and Wyndham and Windsor counties are one and two in terms of number of ash in Vermont. Yeah, yeah, we, we really do. 
<laughs> okay. Well, let, let me let me let me see if I can get through this because I only have five minutes, but I will answer your question. I promise. I'll stay here all night afterwards if, if we need to. But um, what we want to share is that planning and preparation can help towns to deal with these impacts that are coming. And we want towns to know, and we hope that you'll take this message back to your town, that, that the citizens in the town are going to be having all kinds of questions, just like we're doing tonight, you know. Um, and, and they're going to need help. And, and we, our department can provide some of that technical help. Um, sorry about this. It's refreshing. We can provide technical assistance in addition to these items uh, on our website and on another website. Oh, I should have written it down. But it's easy to remember, vtinvasives.com. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of material that we've put together here. And, and so we can provide technical assistance. Uh, when it comes to state or federal money, sorry. <laughs> don't, don't count on it. Um, it, 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 just, it just doesn't exist now, and the odds of it, it you know, happening are, are very slim. Um, so what this is meaning is that, that the citizens and, and the municipalities are going to bear the burden of, of dealing with these trees that are going to die. Municipalities are going to have to handle the ones that become hazards. It's, just, it's a moral and legal obligation. Um, the rest of them, uh, we're just going to have to try to figure out the best way to capture whatever value there is. A lot of towns out west, they cut them down, they chip them up, and they burn them to make electricity. But we all know, you know, chips are not the highest value uh, that we might get. Uh, and so if we, if we recognize what's happening ahead of time uh, and, and let people know that, that own, uh, you know, portable sawmills and that, that are, are artisans and woodworkers and, and so forth, if, if towns know that they're going to have to replace guardrails or, or benches in the, in the parks or whatever, they can utilize the wood that they remove t for those projects. Uh, a town out west uh, had to, and I'm not sure if they had to build a new library or just put an extension on their library, but they used the wood from their ash removals to make the flooring, the shelves, and all that in this new library. And they actually even cut some of the trunks and used them for the, the posts that held the, the, the beams up, but they kept the, the trunks round. So it looked like these roots were coming up and the trunks went up and then the branches formed the diagonal braces for, for the beams. And, and it, it just, you know, it looked really cool. So if we recognize what's going to happen, uh, we can begin to plan. And, and my, my last point, and, and then I'll get off the camera, and I'll stay here all night, and, and I'll make sure to answer your questions, is to let you know that, that our department has created a planning template. And, and if you can get a first detector in your town or some other citizens to, to form a small group, they can use this to guide them through the process, to gather the information that's needed, to come up with a plan for how to deal with hazardous trees, how to deal and dispose of this regulated material. Once you cut these dead trees down, you can't move them out of the quarantine area. Well, what are you going to do with them? Um, there's all kinds of you know, ripple effects. And, and we've tried to think through most of them. And, and we have this document uh, to help in that process. Do we have that in our property? No. Where can we find that? Uh, it's, it's, send, I can send you one. It's, it's on that VT Invasives. Okay. Um, the first detectors in your town have access to them. Uh, if you if you call me, I'll bring one to you. That's okay. The website. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I'm I'm we have, way uh, over time. Have, no, you're right about right. I think we have four towns represented here. Uh, I know Doverson has the first detector. The others are Guilford, Putney, and Newfane, who are here tonight. Yeah. I brought <coughs> this, uh, and and this area of this. 
of the state has the largest percentage of first detectors. There are um, four from Brattleboro, there's one from Dover, one from Grafton, one from Halifax, two from Londonderry, uh, two from Marlboro, one from Townsend, one in Westminster, one in Whitingham, two in Wilmington. Um, and, and well, Josh isn't on this list yet, but, but yeah, he's, he's like in the pipeline. And, and as I say, we are actively recruiting. If you know some people that might be interested, uh, get them the brochure, have them call me, uh, and we'll get them signed up. I'm sorry, you've been so no, patient. My quick question was, <clears throat> uh, thinking of bringing it in from other states, are any of our three states in the Canadian province free, or do we know that they have uh, their infested? We, we, we know that there are infestations in Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and Quebec. Okay. The Can't choose free? Well, it's not known to be there. <laughs> That's the way we keep phrasing it. Um, they, are, they move very quickly. Emerald ash borer is very small, strong flyer. They're very hard to detect until trees begin to die often. And, uh, and they do kill the trees quickly. So uh, that's why we say it's not known to be here. Uh, in Massachusetts and New York, are they close to our state lines? Very close. Where in Mass? Dalton, Mass. Oh, yeah. The yeah, it's it's over on the other side of our state, but it, that that county borders Bennington County, and that county has recently uh, been quarantined, and and the quarantine in New York just runs from the through. It, it's essentially the southern part of the state from the throughway southward, except for like Long Island in New York City. Yeah. Yes. A couple of questions. What's the ratio of? Uh, uh, Migration by the, by on its on its own wing power mm -hmm. to getting here by movement of wood products. Yeah, natural and, rate. And of, I have another question. Natural rate of spread um, from experience in other places seems to be about a half a mile each year. They are capable of flying 20 miles a day, but they normally don't go any further than they need to go to find a good new food source. So. Their natural rate of spread is about half a mile a day, or a, a year, half a mile per year. But it was only 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that they were discovered in Detroit, and now here they are knocking on our door. Yeah. And the, the way they keep hopscotching along is by the movement of these infested materials. And, and that's, you know, that could be several hundred miles in a day if somebody decides, let's go camping in Vermont and they throw some wood on from western Pennsylvania, uh, you know, they could show up here on Memorial Day and leave us a present that we'll regret. If, if, uh, my other, the rest of my question was, if, um, if somebody gave you the job of keeping it out of Vermont and they said money is no object, I, you know, I'm personally a billionaire and I'll write you a check, whatever you want mm -hmm. is not going to get in your way. Uh, I just don't want it in the state. How different would the, stra the, the strategy be in that situation? Boy, that's a whole and new way of thinking. <laughs> you, don't, you don't hear that in my office very often. That's very hypothetical. Yeah, uh, you know, honestly, honestly, the, the approach, the strategy, I think, would be almost exactly the same. We still don't know how to contain or eradicate it. Um, you know, to have the money would help. It would speed up the research. There are some uh, little glints of hope in the way of biocontrols. There are several parasitoids that have been thoroughly researched. They all come from Asia, because that's where this guy came yeah. from. Uh, and and uh, so it's iffy, sure. But what about more stringent controls on the movement of, uh, well, of processed wood? It, it, would, it would probably help. It would probably help. But we all know that in every population, every group, there's just some knuckleheads that are going to do what they're going to do, and, and they'll break the rules even though it really makes no sense. It, it, but it would certainly cut down. It, it would help. You're right. It would help. Yeah. Uh, were you going to comment on that? Well, if we're talking about the movement of wood and knuckleheads, but if we're logging right now, and we don't know for sure it's not here or not, 
mm. and we're just spreading it someplace. I mean, it's not just firewood, it's also a lot of moving out. Right. You know. True. True. And and you know, we're gonna try to be educating foresters and loggers and everybody that we can to be aware of what the signs and symptoms are. It's our hope that we'll detect it early. Uh, when it's known to be in an area, uh, and there will be quarantines that will kick in, there will be regulations like compliance agreements, there, there could very well be restrictions on when logs can be moved. It, it wouldn't be too much of a problem to be moving an ash log right now if it had some larvae inside that are about ready to begin to mature. Um, those mature beetles wouldn't emerge from the log until summer. So, so a truck speeding down the highway right now with ash logs is not really much of a threat, as long as that log is processed quickly. Yeah. And, and so, I, when I say we, I don't mean the department, but, but those who make the regulations will try to accommodate the industry as much as they can and still be safe. Yes? Um, when we presented this to our conservation commission, we had one comment, uh, which was, well, then we should take down all the ash trees now. Should we harvest them all now? Ooh. Well, well, <laughs> we're trying to counsel against that kind of thing. Like you have to give me some reasons why, because we're going to hear this, and people are going to start just like with the chestnut trees and bingo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You we'll said we have to figure out ways to use the wood. Uh, I'm not quite sure if you're saying once we know it's here, I think that is what you mean, but other people might hear that in a different way. Like, how do we use all our ash trees right now? We, we would counsel against a premature, preemptive sort of a uh, salvage cutting. Because, again, it may show up in one little spot in Vermont this year, or maybe not. I mean, I'm hoping not. We don't know when it's going to arrive. When it arrives, it'll probably be in some discrete spot. 80% of the time, it happens to be near a campground. But, but all the rest of the trees may not be infested for another several years because it'll, they'll only move naturally half a mile at a time each year, you know. So there's no sense in, in preemptively cutting your trees down now. Um, also, remember there is this phenomenon of the lingering ash. And if you go and cut all your ash trees, you may cut the one we're trying to find that has the natural resistance th that would give us the answer, you know. So, so um, we don't want that. And, and also, um, you know, we, we don't want to make our forests any less diverse right away, artificially. We want to keep the values, the, the environmental and ecological values that we get from our ash trees for as long as we can. And, um, and also, when the, when the insect does its damage, it's all just inside the bark the Asian longhorn beetle gets into the heartwood and, and logs are no good anymore. But emerald ash borer doesn't eat what's essentially going to become the boards. So, so there's, there's not a, a pressure to, to harvest beforehand. You could harvest, you'd have to do it in the winter, you'd have to ship in the winter, the, the mills would have to process in the winter, but, but we, we could still recoup the value in those logs after the trees are infested. So, so, you can, so we, could, we could spread out the ultimate harvest of all our ash trees and not glut the market this year. Mm -hmm. Jim, there are other borers that also attack the ash, right? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so just because we see a hole in the tree yeah. doesn't necessarily mean it's an emerald ash borer. That's true. Um, the, the emerald ash borer's hole is about an eighth of an inch in diameter, but distinctly flat on one side. It's a D-shaped hole. And all of the borers that are native to Vermont that get into ash trees leave round or oval holes. They don't make that distinctly D-shaped hole. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, I'm not really an expert. I don't know what uses they um, have for ash trees. I know they use them for baseball bats. Right. So my, my question is, if mostly all the ash trees die, does that mean that the few remaining ones will become valuable? They would be valuable in terms of some of the other values, you know, aesthetic and historic and sentimental and so on. Um, one of the things that we're really worried about are the kind of cascading ecological effects that will come 
from losing our ash component. Uh, we know there are many insects and, and small the bugs, the creepy crawlies that are uh, uh, obligatory, obligates, they, 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 they rely on ash trees. And when we lose the ash, we'll lose those. But we don't know all the networks, all the little you know, strings that attach to all the other organisms. And so we don't really know how to predict all of the consequences. And, and so th that's another reason why we, for as long as we can, we ought to try to keep as many ash as possible. Uh, there are actually some strategies, you know, I had to go quickly to just let you know that we've got this plan. We, we, my hope is to get the plan out there and get towns planning. Um, Wait, got, got enough. Okay. Who would we, so we each commission 10 minutes to t share what it is that you're doing so that we can all get ideas from each other and so we can coordinate with each other. So who would like to go first? I'll go first. Help me. So, um, could you say your name? Yeah, sure. I'm Pamela Cubbage. I'm chair of the Putney Conservation Commission and um, Pat Shields and Ann Carey are also commissioners who are here tonight. So let's see. Um, what are we doing? <laughs> We're doing, well, yes, the big, our big project um, uh, that we started ostensibly last winter when we didn't have winter um, was a wildlife tracking program. And we've been working with, um, with Patty Smith of Beak and Jens Hilka, who is, he's with the Department of Transportation now, Fish right? Fish and Wildlife. Oh, is he with Fish and Wildlife? Okay. Fish and okay. Um, he's a conservation biologist, and we've been, Pat went to a, a training for, um, for a wildlife tracking program that happened in Salisbury, Vermont last winter, two winters ago. Time flies. Um, and we have been roughly following the Salisbury protocol to try to identify wildlife travel corridors in Putney um, with the aim to both educate the citizenry and um, and sort of build some interest in, uh, in the idea that we share the habitat with the wildlife and also to possibly inform planning process about where the wildlife corridors are if we can identify them. But um, we need to get at least five years worth of data and we, we have a pretty good um, round of data for this year and we're working with Jeff Nugent of Wyndham Regional Commission to try to figure out how to come up with public presentations for that data. And um, anyway, so that's the big project. What else are we doing? We're doing, we're updating. We have a couple of conservation sites um, in Putney and um, we built some kiosks for the two of those that are fairly public, oh, I don't know, 10-ish years ago. And we're updating one of them with some his, history and information about the site and we also put in a trail um, on one of those sites not too long ago. We're putting in a trail, I should say. The trail is in but it's got some natural history and um, geological identification markers that we're working on um, creating a, a brochure that you could, you know, a trail guide that you can walk with. Wilson Wetland. Oh, Wilson Wetland. How could I forget? Yeah, so um, the big project of last year, thanks largely to Anne, um, was that we worked with the town to buy uh, what, uh, part of the big Sacketsbrook wetland that was on the market um, for a reduced rate. The owner was really generous and, and gave the town a big um, donation. Um, and uh, some of the commissioners and some citizens have been developing, are developing um, a stewardship plan for that land. It's 26 acres? 26 acres, class two wetland, really important area of the town for recreation and wildlife habitat. So we're working, and also it, it contains or surrounds the, um, it's the, the closest source protection area for the municipal well for the water system in Putney, which is a shallow sand and gravel aquifer fed well that comes out of that water. What else? Yeah, well, we have, yeah, it is a lot. We have um, ongoing projects. We have a little uh, garden in the center of town we maintain, and we try to do some maintenance on the conservation sites. And, and 
Oh, we have public programs. And yeah, I wanted to say that too. We had Jim come in January, and we happened to just happen to luck into really good press. We had a front page article in The Reformer because there wasn't much else happening that day, I guess. I don't know. And we had uh, really great attendance. And we, we last, was it last summer we had? We've had two programs in about the last 18 months. Um, um, oh, we had, well, we had a program on beavers that Patty Smith did. But that was really great. And that was uh, with the intent of trying to get um, people educated and aware of the Wilson Wetland Project. But we also did a program. We had not, not this past winter, but the winter before, two winters ago when we had so much snow, we had a whole lot of bear. Um, bear visits to bird feeders in the village in Putney, like in places where we wouldn't expect bears, and a lot of concern about bears. So we had, um, what's the name of the bear biologist who came? Forrest yeah. Hammond. Forrest Hammond came and did a presentation, and that was really well attended. So um, I would encourage anybody else who can put it together to do a public presentation, because people came from Guilford and Westminster and I don't know where else, from a surprising distance for our program in January. Um, to hear about um, Woolly Adelgids. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, thanks. Say, right? so, yeah, that's why. Okay. I'm Peter Seuss from uh, Brattleboro Conservation Commission. And um, we've been very busy with uh, trails. The, uh, the one on uh, Round Mountain at the, uh, at the foot of Ames Hill Road is, pre is, is complete. Uh, it's now well signed. And uh, and well used. I'm glad to say it's quite a you know do do take it. It's quite it's quite steep, but um, that, that that's an achievement. We've um, uh, we've been we're working and we'll be breaking uh, ground on another one in West Brattleboro uh, in the vicinity of Stockwell Drive, and uh, some of it is town owned and uh, uh, a long stream, but at, at key points uh, the, the natural trail crosses. Um, private property and sort of edges around corners and things. So we've been dealing with each of those um, and at this point have, have got clearance and permission and okay to, to have a continuous uh, trail. Um, and we've been, uh, we're, we're working on a map of all the Brattleboro trails which is in a very late st stage of uh, near completion and uh, we're looking forward to getting that out and it'll be up on the, on the town website too and um, get it at key places around town because some, we, Brattleboro is a gateway for recreational activity in the whole state and people come in wanting to know what they can do in our area. Um, and um, uh, we're about to um, t t take on an inspection and we paired up among ourselves uh, and divided all the town owned uh, uh, lots and properties and odd assortments scattered all about that are undeveloped and kind of you know, under, unused and uh, so we, we, we're all going to, as soon as, we, as, soon as the, we can see the ground, we're going to start fanning out, uh, looking at them to, uh, with an, from an impressionistic point of view of what potential they might have of, of, uh, uh, of all in, uh, different kinds. Uh, we are um, starting work on a survey that we're going to send to all major uh, owners of major undeveloped properties in the area uh, and to see where that might go. Um, who are they? Would they like to caucus in any way? Would they like to get around the table and discuss uh, um, conservation values? Uh, around keeping land undeveloped, um, obviously particularly ones that are contiguous uh, and, and about each other are going to be uh, in interesting. So um, we're, we're still sort of designing that, uh, that survey and the questions. Um, we don't want to sort of raise anybody's suspicions about what we might be up to, but we, you know, if they're willing to participate, let, let us know what their onward intentions for their property are. I, um, without knowing exactly where that's going to lead, I think it's going to be a very helpful um, uh, information. Um, and uh, w um, our, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, planning department keeps us, uh, and I'd be curious if that's true for everybody, but um, at each meeting we're informed of any new applications that have come up before the DRB 
and uh, you know we look at them, discuss them, um, decide if the, our potential conservation implications in an application and there was one that came up uh, at the foot of Black Mountain Road uh, just right after the bridge over I-91 where there's going, to, um, there's going to be a development of about 30 units for middle income senior housing um, and we did have some questions about that, did a little bit of research, found there are some um, if not protected in, endangered uh, uh, flora in the in the area, and so we we talked to the state a little bit about that. This will probably get picked up in the Act 250 process, but uh, just an example of how we're trying to stay alert and sensitive to uh, to development uh, proposals as they uh, come along. And I really like that it's now part of our process that every new DRB application gets is brought to our attention by the by the planning department. And um, we uh, did a, um, the VTrans uh, ostensibly um, is doing a good job of soliciting public um, and stakeholder uh, input into the bridge. The next piece of I-91 work is going to be the big span over the West River. <laughs> and we had some opinions uh, about that and, we'd, and, and we took those to VTrans. We wrote a sort of amicus a uh, letter to them and we participated in their public uh, uh, opinion gathering and um, they and as far as we can tell it's not just window dressing V trans do seem to be genuinely interested and sensitive to people's opinions uh, you know about this um, and uh, so those are some of the things we've been doing in Brailleburg. Hi um, we are new fan what you need? Oh, my name is Bruce Hasselback. I'm the chairman of the Newfane Conservation Commission. Uh, we at Newfane have a small commission at, at the present time, four members, um, and we've had um, some ongoing projects that we've been working at. Um, our biggest project over the years was we have a 165-acre town forest, and we put a system of trails through it. It's it's very hilly and has a lot of water courses, and so we've spent a lot of time every year trying to um, keep it in good condition for the hiking public. Um, the other, other ideas that we've been working on have been with, um, uh, in connection with a couple of committees. Um, we worked with a committee of people at the um, Newfane Elementary School um, where they, um, they owned uh, some land, they bought land next to, next to the school and um, we helped them put trails in it and they put in a whole bunch of um, uh, boxes for birds and um, bats and owls even. Um, and the plan is in there um, to work further with them and put in a guided nature trail, which is in the, in the works, and have kiosks that will explain what that is. And the more ambitious plan, which we're, we're supposed to have a meeting on, uh, hopefully in, in April, is um, that they want to put an outdoor classroom out there. And the idea is we'll get, um, we had people who've gone to the meetings and they've talked about uh, donating materials and it would basically be sort of like a, a theater in the round that would be in the middle of the woods, which is, it's, it's got a lot of really tall pine and oak trees, so it's a pretty natural setting and it would be a good spot for nature presentations, skits, all sorts of educational things. So we're, we're interested in trying to get that uh, going. Um, the, uh, the other one is there's a committee in the town of Newfane that um, has been dealing with Newfane Hill. And Newfane Hill is a very historic spot in the 1700s. There was a village up there before they moved it down into the valley. And in fact, there was um, a whipping post there. We're not going to we're not going to um, reinstate the whipping post, I don't think. But um, there are a lot of uh, cellar holes and the historical markers up there. And what had happened was it had gotten very overgrown, uh, and it was hard to find anything. And it wasn't really like the town square that it was supposed to be. So there was a committee of the residents who worked and and fixed it up. And um, th we've been uh, involved to some extent with that because. The, the thought is there might be better signage and uh, better um, uh, 
uh, informational in, um, stuff installed there that uh, will help people appreciate the historic value of that site. So that's something, there's going to be a meeting on that as soon as the weather clears, the, uh, the committee will hold a meeting and if we can help them in that endeavor, we certainly want to. Um, what happened to us um, o uh, over the last year or so is it took us many years to get people to link to our website and when we finally had people linked to our website, which was a free website, the people that offered it said, well, it's not going to be free anymore. So we lost our website. So we now have a new website, and we're starting to put some of the stuff that we had back on it. And I hope people will, uh, will link to it, and uh, it'll get to be uh, as good as, or if not better than, the website we used to have. We, and we, um, we've got a lot of pictures of the scenic um, beauty of Newfane up there, uh, and people who hike our trails will will understand when I say it really is a gem. Um, but to get to a more controversial issue, um, I think I, I, I'm on firm ground in saying that um, the, when I went to the town meeting last, um, uh, just recently, there was a, a resolution that, that passed unanimously in the town um, supporting the letter that our um, chairman of the select board sent to the newspaper uh, objecting to the way cell towers have, have been um, cited and the process that uh, deals with cell towers. We got involved in that when we found out, oh my god, they're putting a cell tower up in, in um, South Newfane and nobody was really notified of it. They had an ad in the paper that nobody saw. The select board heard about it a day beforehand and, um, and we didn't hear about it until after they had the balloon test. Um, so what happened was there were objections and they held a second balloon test and um, we went up and hiked up to the lookout. We have a lookout on the top of our trails um, which looks out to the north over the Rock River Valley and we were concerned that they were going to put a tower up in our lookout and it turned out that uh, we went and we looked at the balloon test and the tower was not in our view. So we were very relieved as far as that was concerned. But the reason this, um, this resolution passed unanimously at the town meeting was um, under the prior law, thanks to the input and guidance of the League of Cities and Towns, the, uh, all the towns, or many of them, did what Newfane did where they enacted a cell tower ordinance saying cell towers can't be here, they can't be there, they can't have this problem, they can't have that problem. The, the upshot of that is if you wanted to put a cell tower in the town, you pretty much had to put it somewhere where it's not going to bother anybody. You had to figure out, like for example in Newfane, which is very hilly, you would, you would likely put it up on the top of a hill away from houses in an uninhabited area where the noise, the fire hazards, uh, or other aspects, the erosion, would not be bothering people and not interfere with their property values. Well, um, unbeknownst to us, it, it, got, it got no news in the, um, in the paper, so far as I know. It got no publicity. But the lobbyists for the, um, for the cell tower people came in and established a whole new procedure that preempts all of these statutes. So under the new procedure, they can come in and site a cell tower in a populated area that has good roads, that maybe so has neighbors that are going to object and say, well, I'm getting screwed, I'm, I'm having this big cell tower put next to my house, it's the last thing in the world I ever wanted to have happen. In Newfane, for example, they proposed it for a place called Oak Hill, which had a development on it. And I think the development, uh, the people in development were shocked because they figured, this is a populated area, it's got um, many houses, why would you put a cell tower here? Not even the highest area in the town. But it does have very easy access to roads, so it's very easy and cheap for the cell tower people to come in and st stick a cell tower there. Um, so the, the problem is now that under the way the process is, is set up politically now, um, many towns are, are facing this um, problem that they had uh, planned to have orderly um, installation of cell towers that's not going to be objectionable to people, and lo and behold, they find um, our, our input means nothing, our 
ordinances mean nothing. It's all preempted. By whom? What's at that? What level? At the state the level? State, the, state, the state passed this law. It, okay. got, it got no publicity. There was, I think if it had gotten publicity, um, people would have come in and objected to it. Mm -hmm. Well, in the town of Newfane, they, they issued a resolution and unanimous, unanimously agreed with the chairman of the select board that they find this objectionable. Um, so I think it's, it's an issue that other towns may, may be facing. And we're still not out of the woods yet because there was another proposal to stick a cell tower right in the middle of our historic village. Um, and lo luckily, however, um, it was found that there were um, um, the easements on the property that couldn't be used for commercial purposes. So that, um, so that uh, proposal got deep sixed, but they're still looking in other spots to put a cell tower as a, as a replacement for that. So I think that um, the, this, the conservation commissions might want to look at this issue and, and rethink their preparedness, which if, there, if they had prepared for cell towers uh, 10, 10 years ago, um, th that kind of preparation in cell tower ordinances is, is totally useless and is not really going to be um, helpful if they're facing the kind of situation that Newfane was facing. So it's something that I think people should um, take a look into. So that's all I have to say. Okay. I'm Linda Hecker, the chair of the Guilford Conservation Commission. And as you can see, this has been the year of the invasives for us. Um, we were just kind of minding our own business, finishing up with our ancient roads and trying to get as many of the ancient roads on our town road map so that we have the option of converting them to trails. Um, and, um, and getting ready for Guilford's 250 celebration, we prepared a, um, a very nice recreational resource uh, brochure that featured, among other places, Sweet Pond. And I'm sure you know, we've been peripherally involved in the Sweet Pond debacle. But um, the, in the aftermath of Hurricane San, uh, Santana, Irene, our own um, Irene, um, we found that um, the that we were dealing with significant um, spread of Japanese knotweed, and that turned our attention to the other big four invasives that we're dealing with, and you can see them back there. So we have um, kind of launched a public awareness campaign that um, got a very nice send-off at town meeting where we had a warning on the town meeting list of asking for a modest amount, a thousand dollars, to um, develop a coordinated campaign to deal with invasives, and I think we can deal with invasive insects as well as plants, uh, because we forgot to put the word plants in the article in the warning, um, and it passed um, with a, a lot, uh, kind of a surprising amount of support from the floor of people saying, "Yeah, this is really a problem." So um, we have a, a kind of a, a mandate from the town, and we have a little bit of money to try to um, p plan a coordinated campaign to stop some of the invasives before they get totally out of control. And I'd say that's the main thing that we're doing. Um, we are very interested in a, conducting a, a natural resources inventory, and we have a, 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 a subcommittee. We have a, a, a small board of nine people, a couple of whom are kind of emeritus. Um, we decided we could expand our outreach by inviting townspeople who are commissioners to be part of working committees. So we've expanded in that way, and we have a couple of working committees, but the natural resources inventory is the biggest committee. The most we active. Meet with Jeff that's right. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's mostly what we're doing. So please help yourself to we, we prepared our colleague Linda Lemke, the great graphic designer, prepared a nice little brochure about invasives that we have back there. And um, we need to put our heads together and figure out exactly how we're going to uh, put spend our money. <laughs> <laughs> And oh, yeah, we do about approximately once a month walks on the mostly the old, um, undeveloped, um, sometimes abandoned ro roads and trails of Guilford. And we invite the public, and we're trying to deal with the potential loss of our town website when the, the middle school is being moved to BAMS. Um, because they did our Guilford Gazette, which is our town newsletter, and they ran the town website. So Guilford is um, kind of a, there's a little um, hole there where the eighth graders were our, um, 
or news source <laughs> we have to figure out. But um, that's what we're doing. We're trying to hold the line against all the invasives coming from the south. Dumberston? For everybody else. So I'll tell you about what's going on in Dummerston. I'm Mary Ellen Copeland, the chair of the Dummerston Conservation Commission. I've been trying to relinquish that role for a quite a long yeah, time. <laughs> <laughs> they laugh at me, they table it till the next meeting. It's really, it's very discouraging. But anyway, um, we, we have done a lot of, we, we did a biodiversity project um, a, a number of, several, several years ago and it continues to serve us well and at this town meeting we took sections, the, the different sections that are on parts of the town. We had a big map that showed the, the different areas of town and, and did some work with people showing them um, uh, where their houses, homes were and then had handouts that were part of this to give them so that they could learn more about where they live in the town. We did quite a bit of educational stuff at, at town meeting. Um, we have had a lot of input into the town plan um, and we've dr dramatically increased the focus on natural resources in the town plan. How many more pages do you... Probably uh, quadrupled what was in the we quad Yeah, quadrupled what was in the town plan. Um, so that, we did a lot of work on that. We do a lot of educational programs. We've done programs on bears, geology, uh, invasives, pests of various kinds, rodents, uh, mammals, birds, and we've got one coming up. Um, this, where is it back? This back there on the table. Uh, how glaciers shaped our land. Yep. And uh, this guy is great. He's, great. He's really terrific. So if Where's you can, Richard Little, Richard Little, it's April 9th, and it's right here. Yeah. And we have bats on April 30th. That's right. We have bats on April 30th. So, yeah. So, yeah. That, um, we had, had we had done a lot of hemlock woolly adelgid monitoring work with Jim, and uh, we got the steward. What was the tree steward award this year for our work? We had a whole for several years. We had teams going out and finding the hemlock woolly adelgid in Dummerston and reporting it back to Jim and working closely with Jim. Uh, we have Josh Wilcox as our first detector. Um, we do a lot of, um, I, hope so, I hope a lot of you are getting this, that's kind of the, I love it. yeah, beautiful. do you like it? Oh, we, yeah. You know, you, you, yeah. can, you can send your stuff in. You yeah, you already know. Pardon? Well, yeah, it's Jane Michaud who's, who do, does this, um, who does a really nice job with this. And I think, okay, this is, the, this, there's, there's about, we have a, a list, we, a, a, every activity that we have, and it's over there on the table t tonight, if you want to be on this list, you get these every week or two or three, depending on what's going on. And if you look at this, if you pass it around, I couldn't get it on one page. But there's all of the, we try to include all of the natural resources stuff that's going on in the area. So it often has stuff from Beak, it has stuff from other commissions, um, whatever. We're, we're glad to put it on there. So, yeah, yeah, she does a great job with it. So um, if you're not on that list, you can get on that list. It's, it's, it's really, um, it's been really a nice, nice thing. It keeps, you get lots of, positive feedback from that. Mary Ellen, do you want to um, um, just say how someone who's watching on TV could get on the list if they want to? Yeah, somebody could, somebody could get on that list um, by going to the website, um, Dummerston Conservation, um, and that was the next thing I was, yeah, dummersonconservation.com. Um, that's, and, and, and you can sign up there. There's a place where you can sign up for, um, to get on this list. Um, and, um, that's another thing I wanted to mention is that we have a really wonderful, active website. Betsy Whitaker, who's here, really keeps up with our website. Um, and so check it out. It's at Dumberston Conservation. And we're, we try to keep, keep it current with all the stuff that we've got going on. Um, we also have a blog that um, with various, we, ha we have people on our commission, particularly John, who's out walking around 
and seeing things all the time. And Lynn set up, Lynn Levine, who's here before, set up a blog so that people can send in, but that's open to anybody. Anybody can send their stuff in and be part of that blog, and you can access that through the website and get to be, um, to, to take part in that blog. And if we're going to have a meeting and we'll be announcing it um, coming up sometime in April to teach people how to use that blog. But, you know, it, it's really nice for me. I have other things that I'm doing on my computer, and all of a sudden something pops up that, that John has just seen a flock of geese heading north or, or something. It's, it's just, it's great. We're, we're, we're even getting Pat Jakewith, who was on our commission, moved to Utah, and we're getting stuff now on the blog from Utah. So it's, it's a... The blog, the blog workshop is going to be at the school on April 23rd at the Dumbarton School at 7 p.m. Okay, so everybody is welcome to come to the blog. If you haven't looked at the blog, it's really beautiful. So it would be worth it to check it out. You can go to the website and click on the link. And is this a workshop to teach people how they're doing the blog? Yes. yes. Could you repeat that information? Again? It's on uh, Tuesday, April 23rd at 7 p.m. Okay. All right. Good. Shakespeare's birthday, okay. And um, I will be speaking in Shakespearean iambic pentameter throughout the train. Um, we, we, do, we do a lot of inventorying. John has really been scouring the town. We're really trying to get a sense of what's here. You keep finding more and more um, diversity within the town, and we want to have a record of that, and so there's a really he's he's documenting all of that and then Betsy's putting it into the computer so we've got these extended lists of all this, the stuff that's here um, so that, you know, in 50 or 100 years people are going to know what was here. They're going to have something to work with. Plus it's, it's incredibly interesting and we, we want to know what it is that we have to work with, what we're, what our habitats are, so it's, it's, it's great. So. The first of our inventory walks, which s many of you have come on, is going to be at April 20th, meet down at the Covered Bridge. Uh, John's going to take a group out, and what those groups just just meander and look at stuff. Yeah. And, and it's really, so you have to have a lot of the ambition and just go. <laughs> uh, and so, and I wanted to talk to you about the bio blitz. We've got a, a, a okay, yeah, the, the, we're doing this, this great thing in July. Um, where we're going to ha have a, an area of the town and people come and we see what we can find, what's, what's in that area. Um, where did they start doing these bio blitzes? Oh, Vins. gosh, I looked at, well, Vins did one, but I, I can't remember where the very first one was, but it's actually, I think it was like 2001, it's relatively recent. And yeah. I know the first one I did was probably around then, we did one at Anna for grad students. Yeah. I mean, it can be for the public. Often it's a combination of scientists, kind of leaders, and um, and the public, and you students, and you want to get you know, your kids involved. It's an opportunity for education and for people to contribute yeah. um, and to learn about what species are are in their town, in mm -hmm. their park, whatever area it is that's being surveyed. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's a way to add. Um, to our knowledge about the area. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of a gala event. <laughs> We're going to make it kind of. We have so. Prospect Hill is actually uh, right up the street from here. Just so that way. Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> turned around. Okay, you, you park across the street from the Grange because there's no parking out there and then go up towards the road. Oh, that was
Good. Okay. So we we work closely with other town committees. Um, we some we have some some people that go back and forth between the different committees. Actually, Bill does a lot of that. Bill, Bill Schmidt and um, the between the planning commission, the farm lane committee, the corridor committee, and the trails committee. So that so that we always we know what everybody else is doing, and that's really helpful, so that we can have a lot of input. Um, and we do stewardship on Prospect Mountain. We kind of take care of that. There's a there's trustees for the, that mountain, but we uh, we're going to have to be doing some work up there because there's a, it's a lot of invasives have come in. It's it's a challenge to keep that hill it clear. Yeah. It's a really beautiful area, and it's a it's a project to, to keep it clear. Uh, we support work on Black Mountain, but there's the, there's the Friends of Black Mountain, but there's also we keep tabs all on the that. Friends of Black Mountain are also on the. All the yeah, right. so it all works out. So, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we have a rain garden. If you haven't seen our rain garden, watch it when you go there because it's surrounded with poison ivy. But it's a, um, it's, native. yeah, it's native. Yeah. Is it native? Yes, it is. Uh, any, anyway, um, that's, it's, 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 it's the pardon? Where is it? Next, n near the covered bridge is kind of a demonstration project that we did with the Soil Conservation Commission about a different way of handling the runoff from the road rather than having it go directly into a, into a culvert and into the river that instead the, the, the water goes into this rain garden and di disperses. So, so that's kind of what we're, what we're doing. We're busy. Yes. <laughs> we, 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 we do a lot. We've got an active commission, um, and so, so it's good. We get a lot done. Is that what it is? I'm, 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 I've gotten, the, the longer they keep me as chair, the better I get at delegating. Yes. <laughs> so, so. so okay. two different um, things. So. Through the municipal planning program, if your town is in the process of updating your town plan, and you want to really beef up your natural resources chapter, it's possible you could apply for grant funding to, part of that grant funding could be to do a natural resource inventory in the process of updating your town plan. Mm -hmm. Bill? <coughs> yeah, um, <coughs> listening to the contributions from different towns is one sort of theme that <coughs> became apparent to me and that it may be the, the uh, possibility of coordinating projects, doing it at the same time and, and working together, particularly when we have contiguous uh, town lines. <clears throat> I was thinking of that with the uh, uh, wildlife corridors from Putney. Obviously, we share quite <coughs> a, a big <coughs> uh, boundary there. Or the Trails Park going from Prospect Mountain through Putney and on up to, to mm -hmm. Westminster, wherever, or with New Fame, the, your uh, town <coughs> forest is surrounded on two sides, more or less, by Dummerston, and we are thinking about developing some trails right up in that same area, which would be great to connect. So, uh, so, so, so what I'm hearing is your support for this idea that maybe we have a an executive coordinating committee that meets once in a while in between. Sure, so I'm also proposing that some of our projects might even be more effective resources, uh, give more bang for the buck if we work together on something. Right, right, right. And then that could come out, of, as it is now, coming out of meetings like this, where it's you know, more open rather than just Three people maybe that get together every other month to just see if